Can you hear me? Yes, I think it's a little better like this. Good afternoon to everybody. I today am going to talk to you about a serious uh, community acquired viral pneumonia. When must we consider it? Community acquired viral pneumonia is something that we have heard uh, a lot of talk about because of the uh, um, H1NA uh, virus that we talked about. But we get the impression that over the last few years, there is a greater frequency of detection of this uh, virus. In 2002, as you can see here on this slide, that was a meta-analysis that uh, covered nine different studies of community-acquired pneumonia, you can see that the incidence of this virus was 11.7% uh, for, and for pneumonia patients hospitalized, hospitalized in ICU, 5%. There was also a study that was published in 2007, and Chilean authors found a non-negligible number of cases, 23% of cases of viral pneumonia, basically influenza and parainfluenza viruses, and there are more and more of them. And this last work that comes from Korea, published in the Blue Journal in 2012, was looking at severe community-acquired pneumonia that required emergency care. And you can see that in a non-negligible number of cases, i.e. 40% of cases, there were viruses, uh, rhinoviruses, uh, parainfluenza, uh, influenza, and so on and so forth. So why is there an ever-increasing amount of uh, these viruses? Probably because we're looking for them to start with, and secondly, because uh, molecular biology PCR techniques have improved. So today, we can actually go and look for nearly every virus that exists, certainly some viruses that we did not know exist a few years ago, such as the coronavirus, the uh, coronaviruses, uh, metaviruses, and so forth. But there is a real issue. What do we do when we come across a viral, a positive viral sample? We're not just uh, working on uh, bacterial pneumonia. Unfortunately, viral pneumonia is something for which there is not a lot of treatment. So it doesn't really have much incidence if you discover a virus or not. But probably in these series of literature, the fact that you discover a new virus doesn't necessarily mean that the pneumonia is linked to the virus. It might simply be a coincidence. It might just be that the virus is present while the patient has pneumonia. It could be a colonization or a healthy carrier. And occasionally, it is responsible for an infection of the uh, upper respiratory tract, uh, which presupposes a bacterial pneumonia. So you can discover a virus in a uh, respiratory sample, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the pneumonia is linked to the virus. And that is uh, significant for this type of incidence. When you look on these papers and you see that uh, there are 40% of these community-acquired pneumonias that are linked to viruses, you have to take a look at uh, the selection bias. The virus has been detected, but it might not necessarily be the reason for the severity of the pneumonia. Now here, basically, are the main viruses that are responsible for severe pneumonia that requires ICU care. You have all heard talk of other viruses that are a little bit more famous. I'm not going to talk about the MERS coronavirus. This is one that you're all familiar with. It's responsible for cases of severe pneumonia. Uh, currently, it is only in people who travel in the Middle East countries that we see this. There is a less than 14-day incubation. Professor Guerry is here in the room, and he knows a lot more about this than I do. You know that the two single French cases were imported cases, and they were um, hospitalized in his hospital. But this is what we see in the media. It is not what we actually see in our ICUs. The same thing applies for um, avian flu. Uh, there is a lot of press hype about it, but the number of cases, if you look, uh, this is the total, 650 cases. It's not enormous. 386 uh, fatalities, but over the last few years, as you can see, this epidemic appears to be decreasing incidence-wise. There was only one single case that was uh, recorded by the WHO last year. So for the moment, 
it is not something that we're specifically interested in. And then, of course, <coughs> we've got cases of influenza, uh, H1K1. We don't necessarily have them here in France. They're to be found in Southeast Asia. And then there are some viruses that give rise uh, to respiratory distress. Uh, the Anton virus, you probably recognize this uh, photograph. There were tourists who were in a natural park in um, the United States, they were subject to uh, pulmonary antivirus. There have been a few cases in France, endemic cases in the east of France. We know that it's when people uh, come into contact with rodents with an incubation period that is very lengthy and an initial phase followed by a late stage, a late phase that can give rise to a pulmonary edema with a relatively high mortality rate. But that is not uh, this hantavirus is not something that we uh, do um, habitually. Normally, we're talking about respiratory viruses. It's almost exclusively that. And the main viruses that are responsible for real infections are basically the influenza virus, rhinovirus, and sometimes uh, RSV. And then sometimes we also have pneumonia that are linked to the other viruses on this list. And I would just remind you of this slide. This is the last epidemiological study uh, that was monocentric, but sufficiently significant for us to be able to come to conclusions. And the viruses that were found the most frequently in hospitals who were in patients who were hospitalized for severe community acquired pneumonia. Uh, uh, were basically the influenza virus, um, SRV, and the rhinovirus to a certain extent. That's what we are interested. That's what we're seeing in our IC units. There are other pulmonary disorders as well. It was the H1N1 pandemia that uh, made us aware of the fact that there were influenza pandemics that could uh, uh, lead people to uh, go to the emergency room. You remember the H1N1 pandemia had an attack rate uh, uh, of illness of 7 to 10 percent. For epidemiologists, this was just a little pandemic. It wasn't too serious. The mortality rate was only of 0 0.5 for 100,000 inhabitants, which is very low. But we know as IC workers that the most serious forms were appearing in young people with no previous case history with very high mortality rates up to 40 percent. And with this type of x-ray that uh, sometimes uh, led to the necessity for further treatments such as uh, ECMO. Now, we know that during serious cases of uh, um, influenza, particularly for the H1N1 virus, that the virus is circulating and will continue to do so in years to come. We have also associated other types of uh, influenza viruses, the H1N2. Last year, 20 to 30 percent of the viruses that were isolated uh, from severe pneumonia patients uh, who required uh, mechanical ventilation was actually uh, H1N2. And this year, because We've only, we've only reached uh, epidemic levels uh, over the last few weeks, but on the serotypes that we've received, it's about 50 percent, uh, H1N1 and H3N2, 50 percent of each. And then we also have the H7N9, which is a virus that was uh, discovered in inverted commas just uh, a few years ago. And that, too, gives rise to respiratory distress, but we don't see any cases of that in France. Now, why am I talking about influenza? I'm doing it because it truly has an incidence to our day-to-day -day clinical work. When confronted with an epidemic, you can have real influenza uh, pandemics that can be similar to what we saw in the H1N1 uh, pandemic. What does it all look like? Now, normally the incubation of an influenza-associated pneumonia is from seven, five to seven days. It's an influenza-like illness, often associated with gastrointestinal symptoms. Uh, it can give rise to pneumonia or a severe um, acute respiratory distress syndrome, sometimes requiring rescue therapy such as HFO or ECMO. There are no specific symptoms.
symptoms. It's a pseudo uh, flu type uh, symptom. You have dyspnea and then a cough appears. At the moment, during winter and during the winter influenza pandemic, you have to think about this, consider it. It is potentially going to have an, an effect on the way you treat your patient. Now, as you know, in all of the textbooks, there are differences between what might suggest a viral pneumonia uh, and, as opposed to a bacterial pneumonia. A viral pneumonia is normally during an epidemic with a progressive illness, uh, symptoms such as uh, um, rhinopharyngitis, uh, rhinitis, coughing, myalgia, wheezing, flu-like illnesses, and so forth. The white uh, blood cells are under 10,000, and uh, you have interstitial infiltrate. Whereas a bacterial pneumonia is not necessarily a peak epidemic pneumonia. It is acute, of course, for community acquired with a lot of fever. And typically, there is a lot of uh, inflammation with uh, uh, loba alveolar inflammation as well. Now, I can tell you straight away that about half of these viral pneumonias linked to flu, which is what we're interested in here today, will be further complicated with a co-infection. And from a clinical point of view, it is not that easy to differentiate between pneumonia, simple pneumonia, uh, uh, from a complicated pneumonia. For the radiological presentation, for um, SARS, H1N1, H5N1, this is what the chest uh, x-ray looks like. The infections were mostly interstitial and or patchy, but we also had loba pneumonia. These were actually co-infections of a viral pneumonia. Uh, What's very important is the treatment. You know that there are some antivirals that are accessible and uh, that uh, can have an effect on certain viruses. For example, you've got uh, the uh, Oseltamivir, Zanamivir, Paramivir work the best. They work on influenza A and B. For certain severe forms of RSV, we've got uh, ribavirin by aerosol or intravenously, adenovirus, uh, uh, rhinovirus, you've got uh, pleconaril for rhinovirus or enterovirus, but it's not actually on sale. And ribavirin can be active in certain forms of meta uh, pneumovirus, but I haven't actually seen or I haven't had any ex experience in a meta pneumovirus. And of course, for measles, you can give re uh, ribavirin, but it has not yet uh, been uh, confirmed. For the flu, we do have a treatment. You are familiar with these different recommendations from experts. Experts say that if you are suffering from a severe flu and that you are in ICU, the benchmark treatment is Oseltamivir, which currently only exists uh, via the oral route. It's better to give a double dose, 150 milligrams twice a day for 10 days. That's twice what is recommended for the uh, less uh, forms of influenza. But I've put a, an, a question mark there because not everybody agrees on that. The, alter the alternative is Zanamivir that can be given intravenously, 600 milligrams twice a day. In France, you're only allowed to administer it for five days, renewable. Uh, administration of Zanamivir, uh, the counterindications are very vague. Uh, you can't give Zanamivir if there is uh, and Oseltamivir resistance, you have to know whether or not that exists, and whether there is a persistence of the viral excretion despite Oseltamivir. So there too there is a question mark. Some people say that probably if there is a persistence of viral expression, then it's better to give Zanamivir because it means that the inflammatory process is ongoing. We've had examples of very severe forms of influenza where we had extremely lengthy viral expressions, even uh, excretions, sorry, even uh, 
uh, after the patient has left uh, the intensive care ward. So the persistence of viral excretion is something that we don't quite know what to do about. We would like to treat it, but we don't know whether it's going to have an impact on the prognosis. What is certain, however, is that in these viral pneumonias, particularly with uh, influenza, we know that during the H1N1 pandemia, about a third of the patients uh, who had a co-infection or a uh, or an additional infection um, because they were receiving uh, antibiotics systematically. Some of them weren't actually uh, detected. But in patients with severe viral pneumonia, antimicrobial uh, should be given after microbiological sampling. I don't quite know whether this is true or not, but this is the work that was done by Henri Mondor's team and Christian Barmisson, who showed that in serious forms of influenza in ICU, um, proclacitonin did work for some people who had a bacterial co-infection as opposed to some who had one single viral infection. Just a word or two on corticosteroids. Just remember that in viral uh, pneumonia, it is counterindicated. There is contradictory data from one randomized trial and uh, other papers that have been written. But corticosteroids in three studies seem to be associated with a worse outcome in severe H1N1 infections. I think that currently we could recommend not to administer them. We know in any case that on seasonal influenza, it is going to prolong the viral shedding. And particularly uh, for the RSV infection, corticosteroids is uh, completely ineffectual. <coughs> So that's what I wanted to tell you. And in summary, when you have viral pneumonia, what are the take-home messages? It's something that you're going to see frequently. 10 to 20 percent of these pneumonia will be viral pneumonia. It is frequent. You should think about it all the time, particularly in an epidemic phase. You have to look for it. We know that uh, these viral forms of pneumonia can be extremely frequent in the case of co or sur infection. The symptoms are basically respiratory uh, problems. You have respiratory viruses exclusively, influenza during the flu period, other viruses in specific situations. You might have an attack of measles or MERS-CoV or uh, those are imported cases. So you have to go and look for that for in people who ha are coming back from endemic countries. And the hantavirus of people have been in contact with rodents. But should we, we should think about it all the time, but should we be treating probabilistically during influenza periods? Should we treat it systematically with Oseltamivir? I would tend to say yes. I think that any serious uh, pneumonia patient in ICU, given the state of our influenza clinics today, I think we should be treating systematically with uh, Oseltamivir, and we should only stop it if the samples are negative. We should be giving it, uh, giving Oseltamivir, because we know that this antiviral is only going to be active in the first few days of the infection. In all of the studies, we only saw a benef uh, benefit from it if it was administered extremely early at the onset of symptoms. And we know that after 48 hours, it will probably be uh, ineffectual. And you should be doubling the dose so in confirmed cases. Uh, so that's probably uh, over a period of time of 10 days. At least that's what we do in our ward. You've seen that uh, viral pneumonic uh, epidemics are frequent. So the next question would be, what's next? Very difficult to answer that question. It's difficult to predict, especially when you're trying to predict what's going to happen in the future. But remember what happened just a few years ago. In France in 2011, there was an epidemic of measles with very severe pulmonary uh, distress, pulmonary failure. And just a few years ago, 12 years ago, there was a worldwide pandemic of uh, SARS, which uh, 
caused about 800 deaths in just uh, the space of a few months. What is certain, however, is that as this uh, editorialist of the Times said, you will be wearing masks again. We avoided that. We managed to escape that with H1N1. It wasn't as serious as we thought. The virologists are saying that uh, it is quite possible that we will meet a virus that will be virulent like H1N1 and extremely contagious, such as a seasonal serotype. And if that were to happen, then once again, we could have something like this Spanish uh, flu type pandemic. And in the future, there will come a day when we will have to wear masks again. Thank you. Can you hear me?